Alex Mosad, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle to fight back and win against big tech monopolies. Pleased to be joined by Nick Johnson, co-author with me on the book Modern Monopolies. Nick, great to have you join us. Good to be here. So we had a few topics for today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some crypto mania. Again, this is now end of May, beginning of June 2022. So crypto mania, very different thing in today's environment. Um, just from a couple months ago, we're going to talk about also VC activity in Q1 and what's going on in the state of VC. Also, very different world in just a couple months on both fronts. Uh, and then we're also going to close out with kind of a little dive into something we've been talking about in different circles. Kind of the, there's actually multiple permutations of marketplace business model. What are some of the more nuanced ways to think about? Um, Kind of open versus closed marketplaces and what does that mean so let's start off with um <clears throat> some of the fun stuff some of the fluffier stuff and of course that's gonna be crypto baby it was interesting kind of kind of like snuck under the radar is board ape yacht club uh which you'll recognize these like cool looking like monkeys or chimps or something like that um, which sell for raised $450 million at a $4 billion post money valuation, right? So a little more than 10% dilution in late March, led by Andreessen Horowitz, Andreessen Horowitz, one of the top VC firms in the world. Today, Board Ape Yacht Club is, you know, top two by rankings. And OpenSea just crashed on me. It doesn't inspire much confidence. Top two traded uh, NFT on OpenSea with the floor price being what you call 90, 90 Ethereum. It's kind of always hovered around like 90, 99, 100 Ethereum. But what you also got to keep in mind is the price of Ethereum uh, has also fallen. So, you know, the relative value isn't just that it may, maybe went from 100 floor price to 90, but also the price of Ethereum is also down a decent amount, not an insane amount, but a decent amount. And I guess what, Nick, the, the idea with $450 million is they're going to go make a metaverse. I mean, is there another buzzword they could add in to, to, to the reason for this raise and the fundraising? No, I think uh, that that's what the, you know, the press release suggests is they want to make a metaverse for NFTs. I think that's a a bit of a stretch right now. I think their metaverse is they offer, you know, they offer a pretty thin, uh, what they call yacht club experience where you can basically your nft gives you access as a membership token basically to get into their uh their membership club in addition to just owning the nft uh it's pretty hard to see how you really build out a metaverse around that so i'm interested to see where this one goes on andreessen's twitter feed the pin tweet they have is now a different tweet we are proud to announce games fund one uh, $600 million to build the future of the games industries, which looks like a different fund to go in and invest in these kinds of business. You know, so it just seems like, I don't know, metaverse. It just seems like they're trying to start a video game company using the board ape, um, IP essentially, which, uh, which, you know, this holding company owns and they got $450 million to go build a video game with the hype and the following and the characters that they have the IP of or something like that. Right. Well, they've got, they've got Seth Green also making a TV show based on his board apes. So there's, I guess they're, they're trying to expand into entertainment and uh, video games seems like a natural bet, but I think it's uh, it, we haven't really seen any major traction in that space yet. We've seen a lot of talk, uh, but not a lot of action and not a lot of traction. It's a lot of money. It's a crazy valuation. You're basically building a new business from scratch unless they go use this money to go do some M&A or something like that. But yeah. And then they, they got a separate $600 million fund to go, you know, do um, the future of gaming. So it just looks like Andreessen's really big on gaming, which we've always talked about at a real high level is it could be um, a big new development platform. It is an existing development platform with the Xbox and PlayStation, but you know, between uh, uh, Oculus and now this metaverse ideas or another development platform in gaming. That's got to be what they're going after, right? Something like that. They talked about they have a project called Other Side, which is basically an MMORPG meant to connect the NFT universe uh, 
kind of like a ready player one like experience but decentralized is the vision they talk about it's a very big vision there's a lot of people going out of it after it i'd say a lot of people spending a lot more money than them like facebook for example uh going after similar things but it's you know it's very much a completely new business model from what they do today which is basically you know creating nft brands of which uh you know board ape is i think the biggest one but i think the same company owns a couple others uh as well but it, it's it's very much a brand new business model and a big vision but uh they certainly haven't proven they can execute on that they just got a lot of money a lot of hype videos um they've definitely brought the goods in the past we'll see if this current iteration they've just got big money to throw around big crypto funds big bets these really early stage businesses with uh not much more than just a team and some IP, right? Is this is basically what they just took 10% of, um, not, you know, barely. So it's hard to see their current business model being super sustainable for, uh, for Yuga Labs because, you know, that, that market is not doing the best. So I think from their point of view, it makes sense to diversify. If I were an investor, I'm not sure I'd be throwing more money into that candidly. So next topic is we've got Sequoia, one of the top VC firms in the world, has now issued one of its kind of storied big, you know, red flashing light warning letters to its portfolios and, and founders saying, hey, there's a crucible moment coming up. There's a 52 slide uh, presentation deck showing basically not good things on the horizon, basically saying a couple things. One, if you have high growth and you're losing a lot of money, that's not where you want to be. If you have decent growth and not so much burn, that's where you want to be. That's kind of the new sweet spot. So no more, and, and it seems like gone are the years of, you know, we had basically two years of it, 18 months maybe, of just burn money at all costs, growth at all costs. That is now out. And it's funny how fast this stuff flips, right? It's like you still have some mega rounds that are still actually closing right now in the old mantra uh, we're actually also seeing rounds of startups that are getting repriced at the last minute. So it, it's what you would call the, where the lead VC is what you would call retrading. Generally very poor form. You have months of, of diligence and to kind of get the round ready to close. And then at the last minute, we've seen very prominent VCs leading, not just early stage, but like series B, series C stage rounds and go to them and and drastically cut down the valuation sometimes by like 30, 40%. And the startups do the deal. So you are seeing all kinds of, uh, you know, battening down the hatches and startup founders really kind of revisiting how they're thinking about uh, investing. Basically, that's code for uh, burning money on growth. And um, you know, all just very quickly, it just seems to change so fast, which I don't know, just seems kind of irresponsible. And caused by the VCs. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's good they've issued this letter, but at the same time, I also put the onus and, and really the blame back on the VCs in the first place as to why we are where we are slash were. Uh, what are your thoughts, Nick? Yeah, I think, I think this is the sort of filtering down of what we've seen in public markets over the last few months and the, the kind of drastic reduction in valuations, particularly for a lot of tech companies there. Uh, which the result of that means there's a lot of hedge funds that are in in public markets uh, that basically their public market portfolios got squashed, and which means they're now much le less likely to invest in even more illiquid private market investments. And that particularly affects the later stage of VC. Uh, so that's where we've seen a lot of this kind of retrading and I would say retrenchment happening in particular, but then that'll filter down to earlier stage because the earlier stage VCs are making bets on investment based on you know, these companies will be continue able to fundraise. So if the later stage fundraising from some of these alternative sources of capital like hedge funds that have been paying higher valuations over the last few years starts to dry up, then that kind of changes down the whole landscape. Um, and that that's really been kind of the big shift is this filtering down from public markets to private markets. Um, but you've definitely had uh, a lot of VCs uh, you know, play in the game uh, and paying these high valuations and sort of pushing for growth because that's what the market rewarded at the time. Uh, now the dynamic is flipped and you know, it's easy to chastise for sure, but uh, uh, in terms of their portfolio companies, but they definitely have helped fuel this to a certain degree because they've been pushing them to get to those later stages because that's what was rewarded in that environment. Them and basically the Fed, right? Um, we've talked a lot about on the show. <clears throat> I, I throw around this word 10 trillion. We've printed $10 trillion. I mean, 
it, it, you know, and actually here I've got the slides up from uh, Sequoia and that's basically literally their first slide is it comes in at $9 trillion of basically monetary stimulus thanks to the Fed. And basically, I mean, the story they're telling their founders is basically a lot of what we talk about on the show. We had massive, massive, massive money printing unlike anything we've ever seen before. Now you've got the Fed pumping the brakes extremely aggressively, I think too aggressively. And then that's literally their next slide on here. The forward rate expectations. Actually, I actually think this is, I've, I've seen actually uh, forward rates expected over 3% and like 3.5% in the markets. This was, I guess, as of May 1st, they're showing this chart here, basically at 3% forward rate expectation. You have a stat here, which basically says if you're getting a mortgage in the last six months, uh, a new mortgage is 67% more expensive for the same house. The largest percent of shock in 50 years. It's really drastic stuff, how, how, how aggressively the Fed pumped. And then that money had to go somewhere and then it went to the VCs and then the VCs have deployed it extremely well, too well, actually, that's actually our next topic. And now the Fed is pulling back because they completely missed the call on uh, inflation being transitory. We called it correctly on this show for months and months and months, not being transitory. And I think now the Fed's going too far in the other direction. I mean, you're, you're now, it's just such a whipsaw where, yeah, the Fed wants to control inflation, but if they really do raise their rates again, uh, I think in a week or two, they're meeting the next FOMC meeting. Um, I don't think they really have any tact. That's essentially what Sequoia is saying to their founders is, hey, the climate's completely different. The Fed is is buttoning down the hatches. Money is not cheap and, and freely available anymore. And that means you need to run your business differently. Thanks to the Fed and then further enabled by the VCs who were so fast to deploy that capital. Yeah, I think the other thing they talked about was the, they say, one of the benefit sides, which is the recruiting landscape's about to get a little bit easier. Uh, a lot of companies are doing hiring freezes. So for those companies that kind of get ahead of this or do have a good cash position or you know, have better, uh, more profitable unit economics, they're going to have an easier time hiring talent than they've had for the last number of years. Uh, which I think is, you know, if you get ahead of this and you're in a good position, there are upside to be had uh, if you're a tech company. But at the same time, uh, that's not going to be most. And that's what creates that advantage for, for the few winners. But see, this is where I get grumpy at the VCs. And, the, and these slides are just freely available on the Internet. You can just go find them. You Google around uh, uh, medium to long term. They got a chart here. Durable growth with improving profitability is always the path. Medium to long term, durable growth is always the path, they say. I, I just. It's uh, there's just too much hypocrisy in that, right? Like that was not always the path, and Sequoia and all these VCs are complicit in pumping their founders up, wanting them to to spend money, spend money because because then Sequoia and the VCs they need to invest the money that they're getting basically from from the Fed on down to the other institutional investors, and then the institutional investors need to put that somewhere, and that goes to the VCs, and the VCs need to put it somewhere, and we saw these crazy tech asset price inflation that we've covered on the show many times, right? But, but the VCs weren't preaching durable growth is always the path, uh, have, have, have medium growth with a path to profitability, right? That's the best chart to, to, to plot if you're, that was not the, the, the notion. I think we've seen a few TV shows to that effect recently <laughs> with uh, the We Crash show, the Uber show, you know, there's kind of, what was it? The, the Theranos show. They, this, this has kind of become the story of the last 10 years that that was not what VCs were preaching. And that has had some unintended uh, nasty side effects with some companies. So I think uh, that's very much a about face. But if the, the message they're trying to convey is this is what we've always been saying, uh, that would certainly be a surprise to many, I think. Yeah, it's just I mean, these charts, these look like soft bank charts to me. I mean, you look at these things. <laughs> It's like it goes up or it goes down, right? And what do you do at a crucible moment? Either you go down right. or you go up in kind of a jagged fashion. I mean, and this is Mark Sequoia confidential. I mean, yeah, this is this is real privileged access kind of stuff, guys. I'm told that We Crash was a great miniseries and many of you have watched it, but having all the money is not really the right lesson. 
At Sequoia, we believe that the one who wins is the one most prepared. It's easy to say once the news is out that, you know, the Fed's done this, right? But like they weren't publishing this deck when the Fed was keeping, you know, was continuing to do quantitative easing with no end in sight, was not signaling any uh, increase in, in, in short-term rates, right? Sequoia wasn't out there like, be responsible, founders. Time to say this was six months to eight months ago, if you're really going to have an impact with your portfolio companies, not, oops, the money's gone. Now you've got to figure out something different. For most companies, it's probably kind of too late if they're really in trouble. So I think the, the, the ability to have an impact was six to eight months ago when everyone was still drinking from the punch bowl. We have a list of who are the most active VC firms um, by number of deals in Q1 of 2022. Now, with Sequoia's crucible moment and with capital no longer being cheap and freely available, uh, this chart doesn't actually look so good anymore. <laughs> you don't really want to be on these charts. So you can see here, most active globally, Tiger Global, uh, most active in Europe, most active in China, Sequoia, actually, most active in the US, Alumni Ventures, Gangels, and, and then Andreessen Horowitz, and then Tiger Global. It drops off pretty dramatically. YC did 38 deals, Andreessen did 63, the number one uh, player actually tied for number one, Alumni Ventures and Gangels. I think those are much smaller deals, by the way. 66 for both of those. So Andreessen, where they're doing early stage, they're doing later stage. You know, I, I think that's the one to really look at. Andreessen leading the charge here is 63 deals in the US. Uh, most active in the rest of the world is Tiger Global. So for everything not called Europe, China, and the US, at 46 deals is Tiger Global. Sequoia Capital in China doing 59 deals uh, in, Q, in Q1. Yeah, interesting stuff. So here's a fun story. So I heard that one of these top VC firms, not only are they, you know, in these lists of most active uh, investors uh, in Q1, but that they were so aggressive in writing checks that they actually took out a loan against the fund that they had not officially closed yet. Right. But Big name firm, uh, obviously is going to close this fund, you know, has a lot of it committed, but they just haven't formally closed it. I've been looking at this space for, for months. We've been talking about on the show for many, for quarters now, for maybe over a year, just the asset price inflation and how there needs to be a correction. These tech valuations don't make sense in the public markets and the private markets. It's literally one of the most talked about topics we have on the show. And we do some investing as well through Applico Capital. And, you know, it's given me a lot of heartburn to kind of just look at, I don't, I don't know, I can't make sense of these. I, I don't know how to write checks into this environment. It's too crazy. But at least one, probably multiple, but I know for a fact, one of these names, I won't list their name just because it probably it might blow back on me, but they got a loan against their fund, which actually hadn't closed. And they were writing checks basically out of the fund, which hadn't officially closed yet because they got this loan. So you ask yourself, you say, okay, well, okay, may maybe they just invested 20, 30% of the fund um, before it closed, right? So now, for, right, because now it's not a good thing. If you were investing in Q1 and Q4 of last year at the valuations that existed there, now just in a couple of months, everything's turned upside down because of the Fed. And now valuations are cratering. Uh, VCs are retrading on deals. Right? It's a completely different environment in like six weeks time. So fast. And so if you had deployed your fund before it even closed, wow, that's not setting up that fund for a good performance, right? Like not a good thing. So guess how much of the fund uh, was actually already deployed before they closed the fund? 20%, 30%. I was guessing like, okay, maybe a third, max 40%. Talking to a friend of mine that goes, no, no. Uh -uh. Because who's going to loan you more than 30, 40% against the fund before, right? Because you got to write the cash. You got to write the check. You actually need the money. So someone's going to lend you that money, which then you got to pay interest on, right? Turns out the number, this is a multi billion dollar fund, by the way. This isn't some small, like $50 million, this is a multi billion dollar fund. 70%. 70% of the fund was already deployed, which they were paying interest on, 
before they actually close the fund in this kind of a climate, right? In this kind of a climate where you've seen huge haircuts on deals just six, six weeks later. Can you imagine? I just, I just, my jaw was on the floor. It still is. I still don't comprehend. These are very sophisticated, very wealthy, uh, very experienced investors. But how did they get so caught up in the mania that they said, we are about to close this fund. I need to go get a loan, not for 30% of the money, but 70% of the money. Because I think these startups are so compelling because I need to write checks into these deals now. I can't just wait to close the fund at least, right? Like obviously you don't know when things are going to turn on a dime. Now hindsight and, and right, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty here, but now you look back on it and you say, oh, wow, these guys are complete fools. But again, I'm not even saying they should have known to wait until mid-May for valuations to then do a complete 180. I'm just saying like, it's just so aggressive to actually get a loan on 70% of what the fund actually ended up being and then write those checks, right? Like that is just so aggressive. I, if you have the fund and you got to deploy the money, that's one thing. But these, the, the, right, the mania was so insane that they were taking out loans. I just, it's, it's so, I, I, honestly, you can hear it. I still can't get over it, but this is real. And their name is all over these charts, these leaderboard charts. And it's a big time firm. Uh, I'm sure there's others like it that I don't know about, but wow, that is some scary stuff. Not only is it bad in the sense that uh, maybe not all that money comes in and uh, that 70%, uh, you know, the the LTV on that loan might actually be a lot more than 70% of some of those investors pull out. You're also, you also have LPs pulling back in addition to, uh, you know, VCs pulling back. That also means you were paying valuations at the top of the market when valuations in some cases are now going down by 20%, 50%, sometimes more. Uh, so that means that the, the investments you did make uh, have a much higher bar to perform well, even if it was a good investment, meaning in the sense that it was a good company over the long term, it's a good bet. Your return on investment just based on the timing there and you know, kind of rushing it before the fund close means your investors are going to get a much lesser return than they would have if you had waited till the fund close. So it's uh, uh, not a great look either way or not a great outcome. Um, from the fund and it, it, you know, reminiscent in some ways of the kind of 2008-esque uh, you know, uh, you know, buyer's loan type behavior where people were uh, writing these loans without necessarily having assets in the door. Um, it's uh, definitely a bit nerve wracking about where things might be going. It, uh, my mind is blown. <laughs> I could not believe it. I had these same concerns or I don't know, actually that's not true. Apparently, they didn't have the same concerns. I had these concerns. They just kept going full, full tilt. To be fair to some of the VCs, a lot of them would probably tell you they had some similar concerns as well, but they're part of the game they're a part of. And in order to win deals, they had to you know, pay. And that's what the market was bearing at the time. So even if they're concerned, the alternative was just to kind of sit on their money. And a lot of them had raised so much money that that wasn't an option. So they kind of became captive to the game that they were playing. Um, yeah, I think that that would be kind of the, the rebuttal, I assume, from some of them um, that, you know, yes, we felt that way. But and that's the crazy thing with these VC fund structures is, <clears throat> you know, you're expected to deploy the money within really 18 to 24 months of getting the money. So now you've gotten the money, you've got all this pressure to deploy the money, which is what we saw basically in the past two years is Fed printed trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, unlike anything we've ever seen before, ever. And then where did that money go? At zero interest rates, happy to go into riskier endeavors like VC. All these VC managers get this money and they have to deploy the money or they have to in air quotes, right? That's the expectation. If they're just sitting on it, you know, then they're not going to get their carry. Well, well, if they're just sitting on it and then they're charging management fees to their investors, their investors aren't going to be happy. Right. But I'm curious. Now, I'm sure this, I'm sure this exists. So if you, if anyone knows of any VC firms that you know, instead raised a bunch of money during COVID Fed printing mania, right? Raised a big VC fund and then said, you know, I'm just going to chill for like six months. Maybe they even go to their LPs and say, I'm not going to charge you a full management fee. Or maybe the LPs just didn't care and they trusted them and they said, sure, charge me 2% a year. That's kind of market. Or maybe if the LPs did care, they said, you know, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to kind of see where this thing goes and see what the Fed does. I mean, this is this would be true brilliant uh, kind of savant level investor, Midas level, that's kind of the top, you know, investor uh, accolade <clears throat> and uh, type of insight where you say, 
just going to pump the brakes a little bit. I know I'm supposed to deploy this in like an 18 to 24 month period of time. But I just don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I've got, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in my fund. I'm just going to like hang out for a few months and see what happens. That truly would have been the best thing you could have done is just honestly not done anything. Now, again, easy for me to, uh, to act like a know-it-all since, since now we've seen what the Fed has done. But you didn't really know what the Fed was going to do because, yeah, their decision-making is frankly erratic at best. And they've made more than one wrong call, massive wrong calls, like on inflation being transitory. And they've made that wrong call for months at a time. So what are you going to do? Just sit around with the money, charge management fees, and then, you know, like run your business just waiting for the Fed to wake up and smell the coffee? I don't know. It's, it's a difficult position to be in. But that's why this story, to me, it was just so mind-numbingly crazy is that they actually took advances and had to get loans. That's what's so crazy to me. So one of the topics we've been, we've been talking about um, kind of in the advisory business is this, the difference between an open versus a closed marketplace. And we're talking mostly product marketplaces. I guess this dynamic could kind of be somewhat relevant in service marketplaces, but not as much. Mostly more relevant in product marketplaces where you have products that could be sold by uh, competing sellers, third party sellers, or you have uh, products that could be regarded as kind of a substitute that could come from multiple, say, more generic manufacturers, right? And kind of the idea of what are the main value props that attracts a customer, whether it's an individual consumer or a business customer, uh, it's somewhat applicable to both <clears throat> customer types or customer segments. There's two generally main value props for marketplaces and specifically product marketplaces. One is kind of that convenience, that breadth and depth of a product catalog, right? Having kind of one place that you can go and buy all the stuff that you need for that given use case, right? And then the other one is around pricing. What you've seen historically over the past 20, 25 years now is pretty much all of the product marketplaces that have gotten a lot of scale that are really big, particularly on the consumer side, would fit this open marketplace business model. Basically, what that means, like an Amazon, a Walmart, StockX, basically what that means is all the third-party sellers that are posting inventory and posting a price for that inventory are essentially competing with each other. You as the buyer basically going to buy the product from whoever is selling that product for the cheapest price. And that's where you really have this negative connotation that comes, particularly if you talk to suppliers and distributors, the negative connotation that comes from marketplace is this open marketplace kind of race to the bottom dynamic. Um, hey, what else would you add there, Nick? Yeah, I think, I think there's nuance to when you talk about open versus closed, you, when you look at platforms, you could be open versus closed along a lot of different dimensions. Um, so I think there's different ways to look at it. But I think when you, particularly when you talk about product marketplaces, one of the main things that you're really talking about typically when people use this kind of terminology is price competition. Are you kind of openly sort of having everyone post prices and they're all competing directly against each other in this kind of you know, open environment like an Amazon? Or is it more, you know, there's kind of two ways to prevent that. One would be closed in the sense of only certain people can join and only certain people can be sellers. So you're not inviting competing sellers against each other, like a target marketplace, for example. And the other way to do that is to have it be kind of, you know, closed in the sense where there's not necessarily an open environment where all the prices are exposed and sort of this race to the bottom kind of dynamic happens. And there's different permutations of that, whether it's kind of giving sellers more access or control over what you know, how prices get published or kind of different core transaction models that are less focused around sort of putting everyone on the same, uh, you know, listing page or, you know, Shopify kind of has their quasi marketplace, for example, but they're not really trying to create like a central search experience for products. They Everyone kind of has their own shop. So it's not easy to go and compare, you know, a specific SKU across all the different sellers that might sell something that's the same or similar. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's really about, you know, how kind of how open is this price competition? How, how difficult is it if you're a seller to not get caught in this kind of race to the bottom around price? And is that really the kind of core value prop? Yeah, and I think where you see open marketplace be more appropriate than less appropriate, right? Closed marketplace, to your point, Nick, is more bespoke 
It's more kind of providing still that convenience factor, you know, one place that you can buy a bunch of products from multiple sellers, but maybe not infinite number of sellers, giving you a lot of the tools to transact digitally, giving you a lot of the product data and um, ease of checkout and a common way to do, handle fulfillment and returns and policies and standards, right? All from the same kind of marketplace provider, but without kind of letting every seller just compete on price and driving that race to the bottom dynamic in the mind of really the, the customer. You know, to me where I see this closed marketplace versus open marketplace being more appropriate is another topic we talk about in the book, which is around kind of the level of commoditization in the marketplace. So what do I mean by that? Where you have products that are more standard, more straightforward, kind of more pack and shippable, you know, the product is a product is a product. There isn't as much nuance in terms of, for example, what would be a more complicated product, um, something that you know, is, is one part of a system or there's many products that you need to kind of purchase that then fit together uh, in order for that system uh, to be installed properly, right? If you're thinking about home building or home construction or, or more complicated systems that you're going to put into your home or things that are heavier on the fulfillment side that are more difficult um, or perishable if we're talking about in the food space, for example, right? So the fulfillment isn't as easy or as straightforward um, that it would be if it's just kind of a standard thing sits on the shelf, you pack and you ship it, and you kind of just need one of or a couple of that skew or a couple different skews. Right? There's just not as complexity in the actual thing that you're buying where, yeah, it's kind of just more commoditized. Like I just need to buy this thing and I need to show up and the faster it shows up and the better price I get, great. But when it's more complex, when you need, when there's more uh, nuance to really making sure you're buying the right thing, or you want to make sure you're also buying the right quality of product, there's no counterfeits, there's no fakes, or it's a perishable product, or the fulfillment or delivery of that product is, is more articulate or nuanced, right? These are kinds of things where you say, you know what, there are things that beyond just getting the right price on the product, the total cost of ownership is actually more dynamic, right? Um, if I don't get this product on time, or if I don't get all the right products together, kind of systematized in the right way, or, you know, or, or there's a faulty component in this, right? Or where, where, the, where the nuance comes into it, um, where, you, where you're essentially saying, hey, I want to get the product. I want to get it at a fair price. But I also appreciate the service that comes from whoever this intermediary is that's helping to get the product to me in a timely fashion and with good quality, good quality control, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you tend to see that a lot more in the B2B industries than in the B2C. You see it maybe a little bit in B2C, but you're seeing that a lot more uh, in B2B distribution uh, with larger kind of average order sizes where you're catering to a business customer as opposed to an individual consumer. And that's probably why we're talking about this more given given the rise of B2B marketplaces. And Yeah, I think it's definitely a big phenomenon in B2B. And I think as, as you put it, kind of the, the total cost is a lot more or the total risk and cost of something is a lot more necessarily than just the price you pay for it. So whether that's, you know, expertise, value-added services, regulatory risk, if you're dealing with sort of hazardous things or the transaction risk of a part failing, there's a lot of other types of value and cost to be created in B2B that isn't just the price of a widget. Whereas if you're buying, you know, clothing or non-perishable food, you know, like the kind of stuff Amazon typically sells, the thing is the thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's, there's not much differentiation there other than this is the item I want and this is the cost of the item and I'm going to get it you know, as fast and as cheap as I can get. But when you start to get into these more complex transactions that have a lot more transaction risk around them and a lot more complexity around them, uh, then it, naturally there are other factors other than just price. And the Amazon kind of open marketplace model is really geared around and they're pretty open about this. Uh, I guess no pun intended. Getting the best price for the, the consumer um, is really what Amazon is focused on. 
But there are other, other ways to create marketplace models. And as you said, we've kind of seen this with these more closed models in B2B that solve for other primary challenges where price isn't the, you know, the primary thing, the main factor that everyone's concerned about. Certainly one of them. Um, you don't want to feel like you're getting ripped off or you're getting a bad deal, but it's not the only thing that you're solving for. Then that's where you see uh, you know, other, other types of marketplace dynamics coming into play. I think the other thing you see in B2B is there might not be as much fragmentation in some parts of B2B as there is in B2C, for example. It's not the barriers to entry to become a seller for you know, chemicals, medical supplies, a lot of these you know, building materials is not quite as low as it is to say, for example, sell you know, shoes on Amazon or whatever, pick your widget. Um, so there's more barriers to entry. There's not quite as many sellers uh, and there's more concerns about quality versus just price. So there's a lot more at play, which means you need a different marketplace model. You can't just plug the Amazon model in everywhere and expect that to work. Actually, in Amazon business's own report, which they published uh, last year, they did a study looking at what are the top three benefits for, again, business buyers who are buying digitally. First one here, 50% was access to a wider range of products. Second one, or basically tied for first, also 50% is better prices. And then the third one's faster ordering. Those are the top three benefits of e-procurement for buyers. But when you look at, so these are the top three pain points of e-procurement. It's kind of, you know, it's funny. 44% of people said online solutions have too many supply chain disruption and shipping delays, right? So that goes back to that value-added service, that fulfillment is actually going to get to me on time when I need it. 41% said it's too hard to get in touch with salespeople and company representatives. So, hey, I maybe need to a ask a question because I'm not really sure like which one of these five things I need. And, you know, I, uh, like I need to kind of figure this out now. Who could I talk to to kind of just make sure I'm getting the right thing when you have these multiple SKUs that need to kind of be stitched together, which is very often for, for that business customer use case. And then 40% product information and descriptions are, inad are inadequate, which is interesting because generally you see these digital e-commerce players invest heavily in information and descriptions. So I was actually kind of surprised that that one made the top three pain points. But basically, I think what this is getting at is, yeah, price is important, but it's not the be all end all, maybe as much as it is in, you know, as Jeff Bezos says, what is the one thing that I know absolutely is going to be true in 10 years? And that's that consumers want a cheaper price, right? And it's kind of the thing he's like, I don't really know what the future is, but I know that's always going to be true. I think, yeah, it's going to be true. People want stuff for cheaper, but again, what does the price actually mean to your point, Nick? What's the total cost of ownership or total risk right. if you just go for the cheapest price on the widget? And that's where you, when you look into the world of B2B, it's, it's, a different, it's a different price and kind of cost calculation and that business buyers are very aware of. And uh, I, I think that's why you haven't seen as dominant of Amazon business is very dominant. They're making huge gains, right? So I'm not taking anything away from that, but we do have a more competitive mix in B2B than we do in B than we, than we did in B2C say 20 years ago when both industries are kind of, were just getting going. Yeah. I think, I think the other piece of this too, I'm surprised that those numbers in that Amazon survey are as high as they are because the areas where Amazon has gone into in B2B are primarily the ones that look the most like Amazon on the B2C side. So a lot of office supplies, some kind of you know, industrial parts and, and uh, you know, food items, Jansan kind of items. So like the, the kind of widget-like items, that's where Amazon is really focused the most in B2B to start with and where they've got the most traction. So if they're already hearing that when they're in those areas, then you can imagine that the numbers will actually be much higher as you start to get into these some more complex, you know, more regulated, um, you know, bigger item things that don't fit the kind of Amazon model. Uh, as you look at other industries, you know, chemicals, Building materials, steel, and on and on, and uh, you know th those are those industries. If you probably did a survey there, uh, the the percentage that would identify those pain points would probably be even higher than uh, what Amazon has found for the areas it's focused on today. I think the you know, one of the key messages here is there isn't a one size fits all marketplace model. Just because we've seen Amazon uh, do well with a certain model in B two C, that doesn't mean that's the model for every industry. That model fits with certain industry characteristics in the area that Amazon plays. 
There are other models, even in B2C, that have been successful and taken off. Uh, you know, if you look at you know marketplaces like StockX, have some nuances compared to how Amazon works. Uh, and then in B2B, there is a lot different, um, and we've seen a lot more diversity of types of marketplace models, open versus closed. I think around this price competition is a key access there where you see a lot of difference, but there are other ways as well. So just don't, don't be expecting just because something worked in another industry, that's what's going to work in my industry, whether you're a large enterprise you know, or a tech startup, you've really got to uh, make a solution that fits the industry and solves the, pr- the pain points of that industry. And it's n- definitely not a one size fits all game. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining, Nick. Great having you join and we'll talk to you soon.